Well, good evening, ladies and gentlemen. It's time to get started. Uh, we are five minutes late already. Okay. Uh, uh, this is the first lecture for the course Word and Photosynthesis. Uh, the course is authored by myself, Yuri Lander, and Oleg Volkov. Uh, so, uh, the first lecture, uh, my title is Polysynth Polysynthetic Word in Ainu. Okay? And my name is Anna Bugaeva. I am based in Tokyo, Tokyo University of Science. Um, <coughs> let me please introduce myself. So, um, I was born and raised in St. Petersburg and graduated from St. Petersburg University. Uh, oriental department, so the department of Japanese. And since then, well, I've lived in Japan for 20 years and I've been working in this language for 20 years. The Iron language, the topic of today's presentation. Okay, so, yes, so I'm a Russian linguist, or uh, I'm a Japanese linguist, a Russian expert, extract, whatever. So I would really like to thank the organizers for giving me this great opportunity to keep in touch with scholars in Russia, which are really world famous. Okay, this is the roadmap. So first I'm going to explain several definitions for this course about word, about polysynthesis, and then a few words background about Ainu and the Ainu. Then uh, give an overview of polysynthetic word in Ainu, then focus on three things. Pronominal marking, okay, and then uh, noun incorporation, and then on slots in Ainu. And then turn it to a new definition of polysynthesis by Joanna Nichols. Okay, and this deals with head marking languages. So she defines it as open head marking, and I'm go going to explain what it means nowadays. So, and uh, then I will try to incorporate the uh, diachronic aspect of this problem, and then summarize it uh, by giving more salient features of polythesis in nine. Okay, this talk is based on my co contribution to um, this. Yeah, this new volume, which is going to appear in two weeks, Handbook of Polythesis, edited by Fortescue, Mithun, and Nick Evans, who will appear here in two days. So in 2004, I had a chance to organize a symposium in Tokyo in uh, the Institute for Japanese Language and Linguistics, and the title of the symposium was Polythesis in the world's languages. So, and then it resulted in this volume. Well, the, the idea of the volume had existed before, but we, it was a good chance to exchange ideas for us. Okay, and I'm also going to refer to, refer to other contributions to this volume. Okay, and so, uh, well, uh, so let me please explain a few definitions. So word, word in polysynthetic uh, languages. Uh, word is a minimal free form, as we know from Bloomfield. So it's contrasted basically with morphine and syntagma, right? Phrase. And this is a syntactic notion of word. So, but as all of us know, it's not a unified construct throughout grammar and should rather be characterized as synthetic, uh, syntactic, phonological, and morphological domains within which rules of different grammatical components may apply. So, we usually talk about uh, syntactic, phonological, and morphological words which do not necessarily converge within one language. And of course, they vary a lot across <coughs> different languages. And when it comes to a polysynthetic language, the notion of word usually becomes even more tricky. So I would strongly recommend you an article by Balthazar Bikel and Fernando Zuninger, who developed a system of variables that allow cataloging all word-based domains and then determining any potential convergence of domains in an empirical way. And their case studies are based on uh, Mapudungung and Shintang, yeah, so an Amazonian language and a Tibetan language. 
So, uh, as usually, Balthazar works in the framework of quantitative typology, so, and he focuses on several parameters. So, you can read this yourself, if you wish. So, and uh, now I'm going to explain major things about polysynthesis. So, what's polysynthesis? Usually, when we hear this uh, quite scary word, right? What the first thing that comes up to our mind is, well, extreme morphological complexity in the verb. So verbs, uh, words tend to become very long, very complicated, and that's it. And this has been noticed uh, long ago. So already in 1980, Dupont saw defined the polysynthetic construction as one in which the greatest number of ideas comprised in the least number of words. And the same was noticed by Humboldt, who called it a verbular event, right? So incorporating. But incorporation not in the, the narrow sense, but in a broader sense uh, of bringing into the verb of all kinds of elements. Okay? So I would strongly recommend you an article in Russian by Yuri Lander, in which he uh, reviews the history of polysynthesis from different angles. Okay? So, a polysynthetic word okay, can express what takes a whole sentence in most other languages. Let's look at my final example. Okay, so, the deer drew his antlers back over his body or it, the grass. So the I'm sentence consists only of one word, one word, right? While its English translation consists of thin words. So that's very different, right? So like, okay, enter, make, enter, make, enter, to one, stop, make, enter, endless, to one, stop, make, enter, uh, make, uh, enter, ones, and endless, uh, to one stop or eat the grass. Okay, so what you usually do the base, base work is okay. We'll look at balance later. Okay, so uh, quantitative approach is uh, basically rooted in this uh, definition that polysynthesis is, is something very complex. Complex verbs. So um, Greenberg. Um, Greenberg had used the so-called quantitative approach morphine per word counts for polysynthesis. So if a word has more than three morphemes per word, it's counted as polysynthetic. By the way, a Russian, uh, uh, an index for Russian is 2.99, so almost polysynthetic, <laughs> polysynthetic, right? So, um, well, as the uh, marker Kopjevska mentioned today, Greenberg has uh, uh, really contributed a lot to linguistic typology and uh, well this was probably quite revolutionary for the 60s okay but now we don't think like this so if a quantitative approach would really matter right something like Japanese ikase tagari kajimi yasu soda but does it make any sense yeah <laughs> okay <Not much>. okay <laughs> Uh, this was constructed by Miyaoka Sensei, a uh, professor of um, Eskimo, right? So, <laughs> uh, I guess he worked really hard to make something like this in Japanese. So, is it polysynthetic? Looks quite polysynthetic, doesn't it? Okay, well, probably not, because high degree of hallucination does not automatically make a language polysynthetic. Okay, what really matters? Qualitative approach. So, to count as Polysynthetic a language at a minimum should include polyindexation, polypersonal expression in Russian, right? So, like, uh, well, agreement, but indexing mm -hmm. for the subject and object, plus noun incorporation, or some other bound lexical formatives, which at least can be rooted to incorporation, something like this. So a prototypical polysynthetic language is one in which uh, it is possible in a single word to use information about both the predicate and all its arguments. 
the so-called idea of holophrasis, right? So the verb should be self-sufficient, really. Just see it. You don't need these other guys, really. Yeah. So you can have them if you wish, right? But that's unimportant. Just by looking at the verb itself, right? You should get information who is doing what to whom and in what circumstances. Like this. Well, basically the same was stated by Mark Baker. Okay. Um, and that every argument of a head element must be related to a morpheme in the word containing that head. So you, some, something should really, some kind of registry of arguments or other entities on the verb. So this is the qualitative approach. Once again, the same thing was restated for the OUP volume, which will appear in two weeks. So to qualify as polysynthetic language is in, in expected to display holophrasis. That is, the predicate must behave a bare phenomenal marking for all of its arguments and allow more than one lexically heavy morphine, which at least historically originated in an independent word uh, involved uh, and involved such processes as noun incorporation or verbal compounding. Okay? Heavy lexical morphine, noun incorporation or something like this like lexical ethics in some American languages. So, this raises a huge theoretical problem. For instance, the problem of pronominal argument hypothesis, right? So, these indexes of subject and object on the verb, they are often regarded as true arguments. And those other ones, real nominals, are just oppositives to them. So in a polysynthetic language, nouns are not arguments and possibly not close constituents of any kind, but simply oppositives that, oppositives that lexically specify or qualify the actual arguments which are on the verb. Okay, this is um, for very tall people. Okay, uh, right. So, a positive, simply a positive that lexically specify or qualify the actual arguments. So, this raises a question of uh, non-configurational system, uh, syntax. Uh, so, shallow syntax, uh, with, uh, in which external NP, NPs basically play no role. Okay? So, according to this definition, uh, Ainu is a prototypical polysynthetic language. Something like Usa or Uspe are yaiku tu masiram suipa, right? So we kept swaying our hearts afar and towards ourselves over various rumors, which means we wonder about various rumors, right? So again, what you do in Ainu, the so called heretic calculation adduced in Nakagawa 1993, so you calculate the total balancing of the verb based on counting valency of each morphe. So the verb is sway, plural, or plurectional, sway many times. So sway something, right? And then what do you sway? You sway your heart, one's heart, far, right? Towards oneself, about rumors, like this. So you have a monotransitive valency two, incorporation minus one, two in one doesn't change it, far, then applicative adds a new object, then reciprocal deletes it, right? So towards oneself, plus towards plus, right? Oneself takes it, like this. Mm -hmm. And then uh, what about, about, yeah, and you have one nominal here. So the subject is marked here, first person plural inclusive, we, right? Well, the object, the only object, right? It's, it's not marked because third person arguments in I are not marked, are marked. Okay? So, let me please say a few words about the Ainu language. Can you hear me? Okay, good. So, Ainu is the only non-Japonic language of Japan. So, 
Uh, it's spoken in Hokkaido, used to be spoken, Sahalin and Kuriles. And uh, it, it also used to be spoken in Tohoku, which is the Honshu Island, till the middle 18th century. And presumably throughout the whole Japanese archipelago, if you trace it back long enough. Okay, so it's not used in daily conversation since the 50s, but ethnical Ainu probably amount to uh, 100,000. And my data is from uh, Hokkaido Ainu, Saru M. Chitose, my own fieldwork and some other materials. Okay, and uh, right, so major families in uh, Southeast Asia, excluding Sinitic. You see uh, Mongolic, Tungusic here, uh, Amuric Niv, and Japonic. And Ainu really sticks out in this environment. It's a very different language. So I would like to quote to Anna Nichols, who uh, told me, um, Ainu is more like a morphologically reduced version of a North American language. From what you've seen, you probably realized it too. <coughs> it's very different from the so-called Voltaic languages in many respects. So the Ainu people have a very different physical appearance too. And they're hunters gatherers and used to trade with the Japanese. And what's really important about them is that they're indigenous people in the Japanese archipelago. So they are probably the direct descendants of the Neolithic population of the Omon culture, which existed in Japan 14, 000, uh, from 14,000 BC to 300, right? So they are really old in this region. And presumably they have inhabited the Japanese archipelago for 30,000 uh, years or came from some different area. So, uh, according to recent genetic studies, the Ainu represent a deep branch of East Asian diversity, more basal than all present-day East Asian farmers, agriculturalists, right? And they can be traced back to an early split from the mainland Asian populations, jointly with one of the earliest American founder populations, right? Ainu is the only surviving German language from this period. The, there were probably more German languages, but most of them were absorbed by predecessor of Japanese. So Japanese is the language of the Yayoi rice agriculturalists, right? Who had started migrating from the Korean peninsula around uh, 950 BC and eventually absorbed all German languages except the Ainu. Okay, these are the major typological characteristics of Ainu. So it's agglutinating, polyphysating, incorporating, prefixing, more prefixing, suffixing, SOV, predominantly head marking. It has mix, max, mixed alignment, and we'll look at this later. So it has no case marking on the arguments. So subjects and objects, uh, NPs, are unmarked, no cases. So what you do, you basically only index them on the verb. And it has verbal plurality, right? And they jump some out by case prepositions. And there are no adjectives. And I know like any kind of special subordinate morphology on verbs. So a number of a spectral model and evidential markers, but no pure tense. So, and then we've got extensive voice system. Okay? And the thing about polythesis is, is it's not a uh, homogeneous phenomenon. It's really heterogeneous, pretty much. And the reason for this is probably in diachrony, really. So uh, it can be mature polythesis or less mature, and depending on this, some features prevail, some fade. Okay? So in this work, I basically um, used Fortescue's um, approach. So he lists nine traits that tend to cluster in polysynthetic languages. And all of them, to less or greater degree, are present in Ainu. Okay? 
So things like noun incorporation, it's there, large inventory of bound morphemes and a limited stock of independent stems, word formation processes, so shifts back and forth from noun to verb, and pronominal marking of subject and object, and then interaction of uh, locational, instrumental, and other adverbial elements into the verb. So many slots, but relatively few of them obligatory and productive morphophonemic processes. And non-configurational syntax. So uh, head marking type of inflection. Okay, in my presentation I'm going to focus on these three things. Pronominal marking, and then many slots, few of them obligatory, and then noun incorporation. So here is a chart for pronominal marking. Okay. So I'm a verb includes markers for person, subject, uh, S, A, O, O. So in this word, S, A, O, O, basically means intransitive subject, S, transitive subject, A, and O. Okay. These are not semantic roles, but this is just important for you just keep it in mind. Okay be able to follow my talk. And uh, so this is the whole paradigm. These are pronouns. They are unimportant. They are not used in this course and they are chronically they are secondary. Uh, right? But these are uh, something you put on the verb that's indexing. Okay? So first person singular, nominative accusative you see. Uh, first person, uh, plural exclusive, is tripartite, quite rare. So transitive and intransitive subjects are marked differently, you see? And object is one more marker here. Then second, third persons are all neutral, you see? It's all the same for subject and object. Plus third person is zero. And then you have this fourth person, which is a, just a label for a number of diachronically connected uses, right? So an important use for us is this, first person in quotation. So this is the person of a uh, protagonist in folklore. That's why it will be translated in my examples as I. Okay, and first person inclusive, and second person honorific, and well, indefinite of course. So, right. So obligatory er, er, indexing on the verb of subject and object. And arguments, arguments real and piece or pronouns are not marked for the case. Nothing here, you see. So you are the very youngest. So pun is an intransitive verb, so it takes one argument, which is you, right? And in this example, it appears as a pronoun which is very rare, and on the verb. So you can't, can omit this one, but you cannot omit this one, never, ever. Okay, so uh, this is a more natural example, more frequent example, I would say. Naepon kusu, you are still young. So this is the verb, this is the index for the subject, okay? And you get this kind of construction when you have some kind of emphasis only. Well, um, in the case of the third person, uh, you don't have such a marker, it's a zero. So, uh, if you have uh, the subject and the object, if the verb is transitive, then you've got two markers. So the subject marker comes first, the object marker comes next. So, so you plural may have called out to me. So, subject, object, right? Call. call to somebody, right? But this is quite rare, having two of them. Why? First, third person is zero, right? If third person is zero, one is missing. Or when you are dealing with first person subject, second person object, right? It's never straightforward, right? It's never just first and second from the table, so you never have like ku e. Here, ku e here, you don't have it. So it becomes quite hierarchical. 
So instead you use something that is normally used for second person plural, normally. Echi. So this echi no kara, normally it would mean you see him or he sees you, right? But it also can mean like I or we see you. So first uh, person subject and second person object. Okay? Um, so what about third person arguments? How efficient is this kind of strategy in terms of polysynthesis? So is information from outside the verbal word necessary? Is it required really? So the question is about holophrasis. Do we have real holophrasis in I? So is the verb self-sufficient or we still need some NPs there? Right? So, well, presumably we do need them, right? Because third person is not marked on the verb. By, but there are some strategy, some, some means uh, which help to track third person participants. This is not directly related to pronominal marking. This is not pronominal marking as such. But it can help you to figure out who is doing what to whom. Okay? So in Ainu we also have another quite American feature, which is called verbal pluralism. Have you heard of it? Yes. <laughs> yes. So verbal plurality is uh, quite interesting too. In the case of um, mostly, uh, most frequently used verbs, it's, uh, it's there, right? Not, not all verbs do this, but uh, most of them do. So, uh, intransitive verbs. So, in the case of intransitive verbs, plurality refers to the plural subject. Okay, like here. Arpa means one person goes, paye, many people go. So, it's even suppletive. Or, uh, with some verbs, you can use different suffixes, like afun. So, one person entered, here, it was Misha first here, right? One person entered, and then all of you, Aku, right? This is enter for many people. And Hopuni, raise Hopun for many people. Uh, uh, stand up, get up. Okay, but in, when we have um, transitive verbs, it's a bit different. It's about objects. So, to year, cut. Uh, is to cut one fish, while tulpa can mean to cut one fish or cut one fish many times. So it's either about it's either about object reference or about results of actions, right? And uh, 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 for instance, raike and ronnu bear. To kill one bear is raike, but if you kill many bears, then it's ronnu. It's really, it really doesn't matter how many people went hunting. So it can be one person, but killed many bears, then it's Ronno, right? But many people killed one bear, that's Raike. So you're cutting, so you're counting objects or results of action. Yeah. Well, in the case of this, uh, intransitives, it's, it's more or less, yeah, well, it's quite, uh, co-referential with the subject. But it's not phenomenal marking, it just helps a bit to figure out what's going on if you don't have NPs. That's my point. So, it certainly originates in plurectionality, like in many North American languages. You've got this list here, those languages, Athabaskan and so on. So, the Ainu Ainus kill the bear, Ainu Kamui Raike, right? And then uh, you see, Kamui Raike, well, you, you realize that it was only one bear. Okay, and then number 10 is your sister came killing many people. That would be Ronno, because she killed many people. So later, this was extended to the plurality of participants, but it certainly originates in plurectionality. So verbal plurality, so making plurality of participants or making plurality of events of the verb is another very polysynthetic feature, so uh, make, making the verb more complex. Okay, so, and now we come to slots. As you may know, 
many Polish synthetic languages are famous for having some kind of symplectic morphology, or in Russian it would be called grammatical hierarchy, as Volodin would refer to it. So, uh, other Baskan languages of CAT are quite famous for this, okay, which are probably related. And uh, an attempt to build up a templatic a template for Ainu who was made by Kamura in 1955, and it looks like this, right? So, first you have base, and then you have something to fix the base. Okay, so it can be just base, or you need something doing with transitive, intransitive, singular, plural, like we had here, right? These things would go into slot number four, right? It depends on the verb. And this is probably the only obligatory part of iron verb. And from there on, you expand. So, Hamura's idea was that the expansion doesn't happen randomly, if you have some slots. But how rigid are they? In fact, they're not rigid at all. You can do many, many different things, but, well, there are slots, but also you can feel quite free of doing things. But to what extent you can feel free? Well, we don't know exactly, really. So, um, you can have two causatives here, as suffixes, then you can have an applicative, the next slot will is reserved for antipassive, reciprocal, and reflexive, and then applicative. Mm -hmm. Okay, and this is called personal stem by Kamura. So it's a stem without personal affixes. So personal affixes and flexional, they come here or here after this is completed, right? And they attach to the personal stem. Okay, that's how it works. So personal stem includes valency changing affixes. None of them are <coughs> So valency increasing means like applicative positive here. And then valency decreasing means like antipassive reciprocal, reflexive or anticausative. So quite a variation there. So let's look at example 11. Okay, make oneself laugh at something. So you have got base, mina, so love is intransitive. Then um, you've got causative, make love. Okay, then reflexive, make love oneself. And then you've got applicative, love about something. Okay, so plus one, plus one, minus one, plus one, and then, so it's plus two, right? It's monotransitive, so it takes the subject and the object. Okay, is it clear? Just things. So at, at this stage, right, each verb is fixed for transitivity, as transitive or intransitive. And then you can expand in one direction or another or combine all of them in a spectacular way. So pray to the gods about oneself. Non noitak. Pray is intransitive. Pray about Right? Pray about oneself. Okay? So, right. Uh, mm -hmm. Okay. And then give one thing to each other. And so on. Okay. Uh, so, um, my suggestion is that Ainu has a mixed templatic and scopal organization. So, the suffix part is more or less templatic, while the prefix part part is scopal. Scope. So templatic means have slots and then the mm, contents of those slots is kind of determined. Okay? So you know exactly what goes there, what can go there, right? That means a template, right? While scopal means of, it's also called hierarchical ordering as a new pick is as if words were built step by step, beginning with the root. Actually, this is much more I know, probably, yeah. Okay, so if you have something like this in your language, in the language you're working on, then it's probably scopal, okay? So this is an example of the verb omap, cherish somebody, it's transitive. 
and you can have yay pole map or koi yay pole map, right? In the first case, 14a, you cherish somebody with or by oneself, okay? You cherish some object here, okay? You cherish, and then the noun would be here, cherish, say, your child, towards oneself. And this means cherish by somebody alone, while well, this one ko yai omak means cherish oneself from somebody. Cherish oneself towards somebody external object. Okay? So each morpheme kind of really mm, registers or press references to something. So okay, any questions? Are we fine? Getting things? Good. So the minimal personal stem is this base and slot 4. And as I mentioned, it can be further expanded. Basically, well, uh, like Tamura suggested, this template, six slots. But there is more than this, actually. So other things can also be incorporated, uh, included there. So this is an example of how you do things in Aina, how you can expand the verb. So say uh, the verb Ruska, be angry with somebody. So Iruska antipassive, be angry with somebody, uh, with some something, some something, some event, right? So just an object blocking thing. And this turns into just be angry. Yeah. But the, what you are angry with is cannot be expressed in this case. So you block with this one. The object valency. Just like with the fricative, you add an object valency with this antipassive generalized object, you block it. Okay? It means like thing or person. Be angry with thing. Okay? And then so you are angry and with somebody, call, right? So it becomes transitive again. And then uh, with somebody, uh, you add a reciprocal. And then be angry with each other. It's intransitive again. And then make somebody angry with each other. You, you've added the causative marker. Okay? So that's how you started expanding it with an intransitive mm, prefix. This is an example how you can do it with the transitive. So Rushka is transitive and you transitivize it even more with Korushka. And then you kind of delete this valency with yai koruska. So be angry with oneself because of something. So be angry with somebody because of something. This is a transitive verb which can take two objects. If they appeared as, were to appear as bare nominals, uh, as nominals they would have no marking, no case marking. Okay, both are more or less objects. So like a double object construction. Okay, and Urushka is impossible because this one didn't allow for an animate object. So you can be angry with something, some thing, some event only, but not with each other or not with a person. That's why Urushka, <coughs> reciprocal like this, is impossible. Okay, and then there are some other elements which you can add to the verb, like noun incorporation can occur in slot 2 or before slot 1, right? And then you can have adverbial modifiers. Interestingly, like here, not make oneself sleep because of something. You can even incorporate the uh, negation, ne 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 negator here, which is a kind of adverb in I. So, or prefixes with adverbial meaning like like slightly or firmly. Or lexical prefixes, this is not noun incorporation, but it probably goes back to noun incorporation, head and bottom. Or verbalizing suffixes like make something. Okay, sapakar, make head means cut hair. Or aptakar, get rained on. This is pretty much lexicalized. Or actions are uh, suffixes, kosampa and natara and so on and suddenly. Okay, I would suggest you to look at my corpus, which was published in 1916, 
it's co-authored. Uh, it will also audio corpus of Final Fall Tales. So it's about uh, 20,000 words. And what you can do there, you can use this full text search and search for gloss. For instance, you can look, uh, choose from a list of applicatives, even with particular meanings. And then you will be getting examples, and all of them are glossed, fully glossed in Japanese and uh, English. And uh, each line can be heard separately. So you can check it chronologically as well. Okay? So uh, you can explore the possibilities of Ainu polysynthetic word yourself. Okay, so the degree of uh, combinability of various voice markers and noun incorporation can be spectacular. So um, they are encoded on lexical items only when salient, of course. Also, I've been, I worked in MPI local database project uh, and contributed their database, valency database. So my conclusion there was that valency changing affixes are combinable with verbs of certain syntactically motivated semantic subclasses of verbs. Okay? There is an article on this. You should also participate in there with uh, uh, Armenia. Mm -hmm. Okay, noun incorporation. Okay, noun incorporation is also very interesting. And Ino has four types of noun incorporation. Uh, all these are word formation patterns with differing productivity and uh, syntactic and semantic effect and regularity. So, the more productive it is, the less idiomatic it is. Let's put, let's put it this way. So, if you go this way down, it will become very rare, right? You see the frequency, uh, percentage and token frequency and it will be more idiomatic, really. Okay? So, a very common type is this one, object incorporation. So, most commonly incorporated nouns refer to culturally significant entities. Mm -hmm. But all kinds of objects are allowed, like base objects or applicative objects or even causative objects are allowed. You see, 85% for this, almost 86 then intransitive subject incorporation. And then the noun uh, that can be incorporated there is basically noun, uh, natural phenomenon, right? Nouns. Okay, intransitive subject, body parts. So this one like has no lexical restrictions on the nouns, what kind of nouns you incorporate. But usually cultural entities like fetch some water or, I don't know, dig roots or whatever. But that's a, just a tendency. Basically, you can incorporate all kinds of things. While here, so it should be transit, intransitive subject, right? And it should be natural phenomenon. This one, intransitive subject and a body part. And this one, transitive, a, um, transitive subject, supernatural phenomenon or insect. This is very rare, really. Okay, so a common type. So, uh, conceptually unitary and name-worthy cultural activities like fetch water, catch fish, build a house, make a fish basket trap, and cut grass, gather firewood, hear a rumor, or row a boat. Mm -hmm. Okay, uh, this is an example without incorporation, and this is an example with incorporation. So. We came back having dug up a lot of lily roots. So, ta is a verb, is a transitive verb, right? Uh, and it has its object here, third person object, not marked here, of course, third person is a mark. And, um, okay, this we is this, chi, right? It is one, first person plural exclusive transitive. Okay, A is transitive subject, so dig, and this appears as, a, um, as an NP, as a noun, while here you incorporated it. So we went for digging lily roots, right, we went for digging lily roots, so we went for 
lily digging, dig li li roots digging here. So tau is plus two, incorporation minus one, it becomes intransitive, you see? And you have a proof for this because we, the transitive subject we, chi, is changed for intransitive subject us. Okay? Difficult? So transitive and intransitive subjects in certain person have different markers, right? Like in this table, we had it here. Okay, so first person, plural, exclusive, right? Transitive subject marker is chi. If the verb is transitive, then it's chi, right? If it's intransitive, then it's us, right? And object, well, object doesn't matter now. Okay, so we go back to linear roots. Okay, so here, in, in, tra, he, this one is transitive. You've got lily roots as a separate nominal, right? And this one, uh, well, this, this is the subject index here, right? So you index it on the transitive verb. Uh, while lily roots, it's zero mark because it's third person. Well, in 17a, you incorporate the lily roots, right? So dig. Lily roots, one verb, it becomes intransitive, right? And so now you have a transitive subject marker here. Any questions? This is very typical incorporation. Right? So you intransitivize. It's valency decreasing, okay? Right? Uh, and you intransitivize because the, um, the slot of um, object is taken by noun incorporation, right? Okay? So, it becomes just one place here. Only the subject is marked. Mm -hmm. Here also only the subject, but for a different reason, because this is third person. And then another one is quite rare. So, to say in Aino, uh, it's likely that it will be fine weather tomorrow, I hope so. Nisata na sil pirika nankoro. Right? Pirika is, means good, be good. It's intransitive. But seal you can incorporate. Yeah. And what you incorporate? You incorporate this si appearance world weather, right? Si, the same series is in kunashi, kunashi, and well, this is the si world. And the verb becomes zero, zero balance, so uh, meteorological verb, as they will often call it. Okay? So this is valency decreasing, another type. So you incorporate intransitive subject, but not just any subject can go there, only these two ones. And by the way, they are not used independently. So this is the so-called obligatory incorporation. So it's already kind of fossilized and so, mm, there is no base clause, like here, right? So you can't put it separately. So just, just, this is more just like compounding. Mm -hmm. Okay, another one, intransitive subject, another semantic category, body parts. So, cross-linguistically, this is also quite common. So, you incorporate body parts. My hands are heavy. Heavy is plus one, intransitive, my hands is in quality like this in Aino, and then you incorporate hand, okay? But since the hand is just not some, some hand that doesn't belong to anyone, it's the hand of. So there is this uh, index that the hand belongs to someone, so this one counts as plus one, this one is <coughs> minus one, and then the word is, again, it's, it's uh, intransitivized. But here, um, basically, well, by looking just at cool marker, you can't tell because this one is not tripartite here. 
So valency retained. So the body part hand is incorporated in its possessive form, while the original body part subject is deleted, while the possessor is added as a new subject. This is the so-called possessor raising. You see, the possessor is raised to the subject position. Okay, so you see they're becoming more complicated. And transitive subject incorporation, right? Supernatural phenomenon or insect. So valency decreasing. Valency decreasing and, uh, uh, right. So the wave raised me. Wave raised me. This is object. Well, you can incorporate it uh, here. This is the subject. Wave is the subject. You incorporate the transitive subject, which is extremely rare. But uh, at the same time, so A is incorporated, wave is incorporated, while I is promoted to the transitive subject. So it's a bit a passive-like feature, like Nick, Nick Evans pointed to me. OK. so. Um, uh, as I already mentioned, this is very rare in the world's languages, but it's also found in Nihian languages, like in Olutic. And where transitive subject incorporation occurs, it invariably occurs in with nouns indicating supernatural forces or insects, like become tide dropped, become wave dropped water floated, cloud carried, got punished, or become lousy. Okay? Interesting, isn't it? Okay, so there is no adjunct incorporation in Aino. Chukchi has it, I guess. So adjuncts can be incorporated only as applicative or direct objects. Okay, let's look at this. The village chief prayed that she would make it safely to the place of the Kamui. Okay? This is an adjunct. As I told you several times, subjects and objects are not marked for the case. While adjuncts do have cases, like this is an relative marker. Kamui orun, afun arpa kuniye, right? Un. You can't incorporate this Kamui un into bow. No way, not like this. What you have to do, first you applicativize the verb go. So you make it into oarpa. Go to some place. And this or means that this uh, place of gods, Kamui's place, okay, um, can become uh, the direct object of this oarpa verb. Okay? So you see? This is very similar sentence here, but there is no case marker because uh, the place of well here it's of devil, uh, it's the <coughs> direct object of this, right? Or so you applicativize the intransitive verb and you take the adjunct as the direct object, and then you can incorporate it. Okay, so kamu or arpa an, right? So I couldn't even go to the other world. So this is now an incorporation. You incorporate it just like the euros. Mm -hmm. It's the direct object. Also, applicative verb, by adding O, it becomes transitive. You see? This is the transitive subject marker for A. Mm -hmm. If one dies here, it has the indefinite meaning. Well, when you incorporate, you reduce the valence again, and this change to un here. Mm -hmm. So in the so-called fourth person or indefinite person, it's also tripartite. Okay, so uh, incorporation of applicative objects, right, by a equivalent applicative verb, produces a monotransitive verb without the change of subject and object personal markers. So here, after that, since they did that to us, let's burn them down. Let's burn them down with the entire house. Mm -hmm. So ufui is burn. Ufui ka is burn something. So positive. And burn with ko burn somebody with something, right? 
Okay, then you incorporate house, bill, mm, mm, so he burned Pan Yamke down with the house at the place where he had slept. So this one object remains, Pan Yamke remains. Okay, so, mm, right? So, may burn. And with the house, house is incorporated. So, plus one, plus one, plus one, minus one. Mm -hmm. Goes like this. So it's a monotransitive verb. Only one object is possible, while here two objects are possible. And all of them are cross-referenced, registered on the verb. Okay. What's also possible in Ainu is double incorporation. So the double now, the double incorporation like here. So let's look at single incorporation first. So I threw only the good fish on the shore, right? So Pirikache Patek Aya Okuta. Okay, so I threw the fish and then here to, to the shore is incorporated as the direct object. Right? So original verb is plus two. You add applicative throw somewhere. Mm -hmm. Then okay, show where you throw is uh, delete one, slow, one place, minus one, okay, like this. And then, one more example with double incorporation, I threw the fish he caught on the shore. Mm -hmm. So, throw fish, okay, to the shore, right? Also, please note that this is transitive verb, a, a, here, transitive marker, from the table, you've got the PowerPoint, right? Uh, and uh, this one is intransitive subject. Okay, so, well, the, all kinds of things can be incorporated in line, really. Uh, if you talk about object incorporation, even goals can be incorporated, which claim to be impossible in Baker. Um, 27A is a Base clause. My sister stood in awe, like felt reserved. Oripak means not to be able to talk in the per in in the presence of higher person. Yeah, I shouldn't be talking here. Um, then twenty uh, seven B, right? Oripak means I feel respect to your brother. So I feel reserved, stand in awe um, towards your brother. This is transitive. And then I found this very ridiculous example. So I felt sorry for this woman, my lover's old wife, and fell asleep. Okay, so the woman actually is not some general woman. It's quite a specific woman which appeared in this course several times. And this shouldn't be possible really in the world languages. So I wish I had more examples like this. Maybe this is some kind of mistake, who knows. So field work is not any longer possible in Ayurveda. So it had been possible 20 years ago, 15 years ago, even 10, but not now. I should admit it, right? So like this, you see. Again, please note ah here and an here, right? But those things are never salient in this course, right? So they can be even referential. Very interesting. So now incorporation raises several theoretical problems and I am again. First thing, so functional incorporation is characterized as a backgrounding process uh, which is used when the event is of great interest, greater interest than its participants. And it is likely to apply to arguments of high discourse salience, high animus and specificity. Right? While applicativization, applicative, right? Making some kind of a jump into the direct object, promoting things. Please recall the place of gods, which was with ability, right? And then you promote it, make it a direct object. Mm -hmm. So this kind of process is usually regarded as something very foregrounding, right? So why, should, why is it possible to incorporate um, an applicative object? Something that has been foregrounded, why would you background it again? So, and you go back and forth, as you have seen. So, and so what's the resultant function of the 
resulted a polysynthetic world. Okay? Right. And then the final part, I don't have much time really, but we started later. So polysynthetic polysynthesis, a new definition. So by now, let me summarize please. Polysynthesis, what's important? So there is this minimal requirement. You should have indexation on the verb, right? Subject and object should be marked on the verb. Ideally, in all persons. I don't have it, but not in the third person. That's why it's not ideal. I also said that it has verbal plurality, which probably, to some extent, kind of helps with this. Just a bit. Okay? But, um, right. Then, um, another thing is having some heavy... Uh, morphemes. It can be incorporation, it can be some kind of compounding, it can be some lexical subject or something originating in, well, some clearly originating in some lexical item, right? And I meets both of those, these requirements while, um, and it has a template, which is believed to be quite a polysynthetic feature. And now I will present something quite new, innovative, and uh, which does not completely match with what I've been talking about now, right? So, the thing is that, okay, uh, there was uh, Joanna's presentation dur during our 2014 symposium in Tokyo, and her contribution will appear in the OUP volume, so I will be quoting accordingly. So she regards polysynthesis as open head marking. So do we know what head marking is about? So marking uh, relations um, on the verb or say on the what you see. Well, there is a part in my PowerPoint explaining what head marking dependent marking is about. So basically it, it polysynthesis in her view mm, overlaps largely overlaps with head marking but there is an, one more extra word there open head marking so i'm going to explain what open means in Joanna's view so open means that fillers of one or more slots are not closed a closed set like say if you are dealing with personal markers you select from a set paradigm and this and that's not very great for polysynthesis right so you better be quite free, like doing things hierarchically or, well, I don't know. Uh, and then, uh, and or, right, oh, I'm explaining open, right? Uh, not fixed number of slots. So, so not having slots, just doing it randomly. So um, is kind of better um, qualified polysynthesis. Okay, and uh, so what's important is that not every slot or filler needs to be referential. So uh, new slots and fillers probably often enter the verb template as registration or with weak referentiality. Well, you had, should have noun incorporation, noun classifiers are often there, and you often have this G plus argument, which is a kind of recipient or, yeah, She's talking about West Caucasian languages, quoting Yuri Lander, who will appear um, tomorrow. But also indexing of one or more additional roles. So uh, basically indexing on the verb not only subject and object, but other roles. Maybe not indexing, uh, that means coding for person and number, but just registering, right? Registering, just well, maybe something like Aino applicatives in a sense, saying that uh, there are other things there. So, polysynthesis is extreme development of head marking. It arises in large enough and old enough populations of languages with various developments of head marking. So, it occurs regularly in such populations, uh, the Great Pacific Ring and the Caucasus population. Here, you see, the Great Pacific Ring is this, as she says, New Guinea, North Coast, Oceania, 
East Coast Asia, West Coastal North America, Mexico, Central America, West Coastal South America, and Northern Australia. And the Caucasus, for some reason, I don't know why. Yeah, so the Great Pacific Rim, polythensis. So once again, it's extreme development of head marking. So basically, for Joanna, polythensis can be covered by head marking, but just if it goes far away, far away, yeah. The, the degree of synthesis grows. Well, this part explains what's head marking. So the head and dependent marking parameter is a morphological structural parameter which classifies languages according to the locus of morphological marking of syntactic relations with, within a constituent, right? So, well, you've probably known this, or at least read it. So, <laughs> okay, can I skip this? Okay, so if you have predicated arguments, right? If you mm, mm, mark grammatical relations on the verb, on the predicate, then it's head marking. If you have a possessive phrase, you have a possessive and possessive, and you mark the, these grammatical relations of possessive and possessive on the possessive, then it's also head marking. Just let's make it short, okay? And you can study it yourselves. Yeah, by the way, she. Uh, no, uh, noticed even in 1986 uh, uh, that head marking correlates with polysynthesis and incorporation. Okay? Many other um, features cluster with head or dependent marking. So the opposite of head marking, like um, cases, having cases on the nouns, it's, um, it's the opposite of head marking. And you can also have double marking, like make, putting markers on both the head and the dependent. Okay, so um, no, yeah, five minutes left. No closed set of personal markers in closed paradigm. So polythesis is open head marking. So she says like no closed set of person markers in closed paradigm of forms. This pertains in particular to <coughs> referential elements such as argument, uh, indexes, and incorporated nominals. Incorporation is great for this, right? Because you don't select from a set, it's open. So anything can go. But say in I not in all types of incorporation, right? So for some types of incorporation, it should be a body part, it should be a supernatural phenomenon or whatever. Right? <coughs> or open roles. Some polysynthetic languages mark or register on the verb in addition to the uh, in addition to the regular set of arguments, one more additional G plus that are uh, argument-like in some respects and often cannot be identified with any particular case. So in Ainu, in fact, uh, some applicatives have no paraphrases with case transpositions. Like in this example 28, now we are older and we cannot even catch small birds. So on can have a bad hunt. Right? So you either say just have a bad hunt as intransitive, or if you want to say why you have a bad hunt, because of what, right? What, what animal you can't, couldn't catch? You, the only option is to put this a. Uh, and then you take Chikapo as the direct object in the application. So this is register, I guess. So, and this is not something, well, at least semantically. Well, in this case, it's probably not that peripheral. I don't know. So we can also talk about each other, uh, also talk with each other about hunting, right? So this one is intransitive, talk to each other, talk about, that's the only way to put it. Okay, then she looks at incorporation, which is a bit complicated. So I will just try to explain this in my own words. When incorporation is very neat, like I've shown to you, our object incorporation in I. So plus one, minus one, like this. If it goes very neatly, clearly, then it's not great for Jarna. So it's not polyphensative enough. So uh, to be, uh, it doesn't mean, of course, if language has incorporation, it's not polyphensative, but it's probably the matter of degree, right? So for instance, I had 85% of object incorporation, very clear, very neat. And then several other types you would be felt puzzled about, I guess, right? What's happening there? 
So those ones would be a bit better for her. So uh, of these three, adding certainly counts as polysynthetic. And adding is when incorporated noun does not go into any existing slot. Rather, it creates an additional slot. And the other argument markers retain their usual forms and functions, right? Like this. So those uh, number two, number three, and number four, presumably, the types of incorporation in INU would uh, probably go here. Yeah. So why are um, Pacific Rim and Caucasian languages so strongly inclined to head marking? Uh, historical contingency, random, also elaboration to extremes normally happens in language populations that are old enough, large enough, and isolated enough. So head marking happened to reach some frequency threshold in this population setting the scene for polythesis to arise. So we can think of the, these languages, language populations as moving towards stabilization of head marking and maybe even polythesis at 100%. So yeah, that's the thing. And when Fortescue 2013, one polysynthetic morphology is old enough and uh, enough morphological change has happened, inflection and derivation get intermingled. I think Yuri Lander will be talking about this with regard to um, Adige. And at this point of no return, the language cannot evolve into a non polysynthetic one. Okay, next one, I don't have if I have time, I don't think I have time for this, but just very briefly, polysynthesis can be new or old. And the symptomatic uh, features are the following. So lexical forces of derivational affixes are transparent, right? And then it's new. So if lexical sources of derivational affixes are transparent, then it's new and it's plus. Okay? Plus and minus is old. So residual stress on incorporated or serialized stems means that um, you incorporate noun, but it has retains its own stress. That doesn't happen in I. Okay, so it's just a word here phonologically. Only one stress is possible in this sense. I is old, and then a uh, strict adhesion to baby. So derivation affix is closer to the stem than inflection. Okay, I know works this way, so it's new. If polysynthesis is old enough, polysynthesis is old enough, then it gets all intermingled, really, yeah, mixed up. Inflexional derivational affixes, you can't tell the difference, uh, there is no certain order, okay? Uh, and then conductivity of incorporation of serial verbs. Okay, this is my reasons for Ainu. And uh, let me please sum up. Mm -hmm. So I also has this bit is Eskimo like incorporation. When you incorporate, but these words do not exist as separate lexical items as nouns any longer. So in my view it's quite old. Older than forty few things. So polysynthetic word in I salient characteristics, complexity. It's characterized by certain complexity. So words can be long, can be complex, but don't they don't have to. They they can be, right? So, fully indexation, so subjects and objects are indexed on the verb. And I don't know what's the status of pronominal arguments, probably they have no serious status, the, the separate NPs. Applicatives can be seen as means of registering one more additional G plus in Joanna's terms. Rule on the verb, noun incorporation. Only arguments can be incorporated. So, most syntactic types show semantic preferences for incorporated nouns. So, but yeah, I'm really curious about object incorporation. I've shown to you today that even quite specific things, even goal objects can be incorporated like this woman who I feel sorry to, right? Okay, what, what are the limits? Holophrasis. Well, it does have holophrasis, but it's partial because, as I mentioned, third person arguments are not indexed on the verb. So mixed templatic scope organization with multiple possibilities for a further verb expansion. So are Aino word forms created online like phrases? I would, would 
to be really sure about this. So I'm really looking forward to the other presentation. It seems that um, this language is more like this. Okay, so I is still quite neat, right? There are more polysynthetic languages. But on the other hand, those, neat, uh, those more polysynthetic languages, they tend to lose something important, like losing cooperation. It gets fossilized there, you don't have it the separate nominals, or they can lose, say, phenomenal markers as NIFA. So all kinds of things. Polysynthesis is, is very, very uh, heterogeneous phenomenon. And the reason is diachrony. Yeah. So whether it's old, whether it's new, what, in what, um, what features are being lost and so on. So what Ainu doesn't have? No serious intermingling of inflection and der derivation. Not like Udige, uh, uh, Adige. So no inter uh, interrupted um, synthesis, yeah? No fourth argument marking, no adjunct incorporation. I guess Chukchi has it. We'll have a chance to hear more about it. No marking of uh, tense aspect modality and evidentiality on the verb. No marking of interclausal relations on the verb. Because you know, some languages like um, Eskimo or Niv or Adige will do interclausal relations. So they go beyond one clause and connect two clauses in one verb. Okay? So the degree of polysynthesis in Ainu is moderate, which is due to its age. Neither too old nor new, but still a bit to the older side, I guess. And close contact with Japanese since the early 19th century may have prevented Ainu from developing in the direction of more synthesis. Okay, thank you. This is another old polysynthetic verb, right, which is so hard to interpret. I'm pretty sure about interpretation of motives, so probably killing oneself for a thing, or killing a thing, maybe killing an animal for someone, who knows. Thank you very much. Yeah, yeah, yeah.